Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Welcome to episode 76 of the Feeling Good podcast. This is number three uh, in the series of five simple ways to boost your happiness. Today, uh, David, you're going to talk to us about um, doing something we are afraid of. Yes, yeah, con- con- mm-hmm. confronting a fear. How, how could that bring happiness? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, when you, um, uh, when you have something that you're afraid of and, and you keep avoiding it, you, the, the fear mushrooms and, and you tend to feel ashamed and uh, get, get more, more and more af- uh, afraid of that thing. Uh-huh. And uh, it's both a psychological principle that's been around for 2,500 years or more as well as a kind of philosophical, spiritual principle that when you confront something that you're afraid of rather than running away, you you will usually discover that the monster has no teeth. And then you experience a great feeling of joy and and liberation. It's it's actually one of the important basic ideas behind Tibetan Buddhism, but it's it's built into most most religions uh, as well, but from a, a practical point of view, if, if you have fears and you confront them and, and defeat them, it, it can be exhilarating. And I know from personal experience, I've mentioned on previous podcasts, and by the way, if you want to supplement today's podcast, order my book on Amazon or wherever, When Panic Attacks is the name of the book, and it's it's not only how to confront your fears, but there's 40 powerful techniques in there for defeating every conceivable kind of anxiety. But when yeah. I was when I was writing that book, I, I just started thinking about all of the the fears that I've had had in my life, uh, and there's at least 17 fears and phobias that that, that I've had, and. Uh, and I think that's why I just love working with people with fears and phobias, because whatever you have, social anxiety or fear of this or the fear of that, I, I can generally say I've had that, and I, I can show you the way, the way out of the woods. And it, right, it, yeah, it, first-hand it's, experience. Yeah, it, that, 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 that's right. You know, my favorite one really is, is social anxiety. I, I had that so severely, and it seems so common, public speaking anxiety, social anxiety, we... I'm treating it with colleagues on the Sunday hikes all the time. But some of my own fears growing up was, I, I, it's hard to remember them all because there were so many of them that I've had at one time or another. I had a horrible fear of vomiting, a fear of blood, a fear of bees, a fear of horses, a fear of dogs. I've had five different kinds of social anxiety. Uh, I had a panic attack once. Uh, I've had hypochondriasis, you know, the the belief that I yeah, was yeah. dying, and you know, all all of these Being sick, all of these things, and uh, and when you get over them, it's 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 just it's just it's just a tremendous thing, and but it takes courage. It's simple, but it takes tremendous courage because anxiety is an intensely unpleasant emotion, and the key to defeating it is instead of running away from whatever you're afraid of to to confront that fear and experience the anxiety until the anxiety disappears so so re- really it's uh, it's totally doing the opposite of what we are trained to do which is yeah. when i'm afraid I, I run away from the source of the fear and That's this right. is just the the opposite a- absolutely absolutely and it's such a shock pleasant shock to the system when when you discover that that the monster has no teeth, it's 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 liberation. The the Buddhists really called it one form of enlightenment. Now, can you say more about the this monster has no teeth idea? I mean, if it's a monster, why does it have no teeth? Um, because the monster is created by our distorted thoughts. Uh-huh. So it's and, not real. Yeah, yeah, that, that that that's that's right. And there's 
two ways to, to confront the monster. One is called flooding, where you do it all at once, and the other is called uh, gradual ex- exposure, where you do it in, in you know, in, in little increments, starting yeah. with the least feared thing yeah. version of it and working your way up to the most feared. But both can be effective. I, I prefer the doing it all at once. And I'll give a, a quick e- example from, from my own experience. Yeah. Um, and, I, and you may want to detail to people how how they they would be doing it uh, as their own experimentation. Yeah, um, when I was in in high school, uh, I, I wanted to be on the stage crew of Brigadoon so I could get more extracurricular activities. Because mm-hmm. my advisor said, you know, you're getting good grades, you have good test scores, but you have no extracurricular activities. And if you want to go to a good college, you have to have extracurricular activities and so I said well I tried out for the football team and I didn't make it and I tried out for the basketball team and I was cut and he says well there's a lot of other things that you can do Um, and so I went I saw they were putting on the play Brigadeau and I talked to the the, uh, drama teacher I said I don't think I'm good enough to act in the play but I saw you wanted people for the stage crew and I'd have to be on the stage crew and he said well that that's fine David uh We'd love to have you. The only restriction is we can't have any students with a fear of heights because you're going to be working up on the top of ladders near the ceiling, working with the lights and the, and the curtains. And I said, well, I have a, a fear of heights. And he said, well, then you can't be on the stage crew of Brigadoon unless, of course, you'd be willing to get over that. And I said, well, I'd be happy to get over it. I just I don't know how. Oh. And he said, well, oh, you want to do Just it right now? get up there. <laughs> yeah, he said, we can do it right now. So he, he took me into the, uh, onto the, the stage, and he set up one of these upside-down V-type ladders. Yeah. And he put it in the middle so there was no curtains around, nothing to grab onto. And mm-hmm. he says, all you have to do is stand on the top of that ladder for a while. And I said, okay, Mr. Krushak, if that's all I have to do. And he said, I'll, I'll just stand here. Well, weren't you paralyzed with fear? When, I was when very terrified, that? but I was a sophomore in high school. I was obedient. I, yeah. I had trust in my teachers. And I also think that sometimes that interpersonal trust thing from a right. therapist or a yeah. trusted friend yeah. can you know, yeah. really help you when it comes time to, to do something terrifying. And so I went, went up, and I got more and more anxious, and I got up on the t- top rung of the ladder, and I was like about a hundred on a zero to a hundred scale, and I said, "I'm I'm really scared, uh, Mr. Krishak. Uh, what, what do I do now?" Yeah. And 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 he said, "Just just stand there. It'll it'll go away pretty soon." And he said, "I'll just stand here at the bottom of the ladder and and, and wait." I said, well, okay, Mr. Krasiak, but aren't there special words I'm supposed to say or something? Incantation. <laughs> yeah. And he says, no, just, just just wait. It'll it'll disappear pretty soon. And so I waited, you know, about 10, 12 minutes, and, and I, I said, Mr. Krasiak, and it was scary because there was nothing to grab on in case yeah, I Yeah, you were, you know, hanging up there, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I, I said, Mr. Krasiak, I'm still about 100% panicky, you know, and he said, "Well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just, 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 just wait. Just, yeah, yeah. Just, just wait." And then, after another two or three minutes, I would say over a probably a fifteen second period, my anxiety fell from a hundred to zero. It just disappeared. Yeah. And and I said, "Oh, Mr. Krishak, I I think I'm cured now." <laughs> and he said, okay, come on down off the ladder. Yeah. You can be on the stage crew of Brigadoon. And that, that was really, really all it took. Uh, and then I, I just loved working up near the ceiling, and I couldn't even remember why I was afraid of heights. Yeah. And it just seemed like the happiest thing in the world for me. And later in the summer, when I was in college, I did construction labor in, in Phoenix, and often we'd have to go up when they're, they're building buildings and go with the wheelbarrow up on this like little elevator thing, say yeah. to the sixth floor, and mm-hmm. then take that wheelbarrow filled with cement, you know, across the right. girders and pour it in yeah. somewhere. And I, I, I used to do that and just think it was the greatest th- thing in, in, in the world. And uh, 
And, and, and so that, that would be a simple example of con confronting a fear, and it, it, it really does have a mood-elevating effect, but you have to have the courage to, to experience that anxiety until the fear disappears, and sometimes it'll disappear quickly, just in a matter of moments, and, and sometimes, as in my case, you, you have to endure it for, for a period of time. I would also say that once you've defeated a fear, you have to keep at it, uh, and, uh, or, or it can come back. And in my own case, uh, I, I didn't ever avoid heights after that. I loved, always loved going up to heights. Except then, once I got into medical school and my psychiatric residency out in California and back again in Philadelphia, there, I had no occasion to go up on heights. It, it just, you know, there wasn't any... So you any, stopped doing it. I stopped doing it, not intentionally, just accidentally. Yeah. And then years later, I took my kids to the Grand Canyon for spring break, yeah. and we went down this very steep trail into uh, Havasupai Canyon to visit the Havasupai Indians, mm -hmm. and, and then there was this steep drop-off down to this fabulous blue-green river, uh, this fabulous waterfall. You, you climb down this cliff on, on ropes, yeah. and then you can dive under the waterfall, uh -huh. And I used to do that then, when I, and, and suddenly my fear of heights came back, and I pulled back and mm -hmm. told my kids to go down. I'd wait for them. Uh -huh, okay. And then the whole thing came came flooding back, so the fear of heights has returned, and so now I'm attacking it again with a slightly different model, which is gradual exposure on, on the Sunday hikes. We, we sometimes go across trails that are kind of scary. I, I've done it with you once. And when I jog, there's a little area on the jogging trail where there's a sharp drop-off. And I used to, like, I'd be flooded with anxiety when I jog across there. And I, I do it every, every day in both directions. And so, now when I go past it, it doesn't make me anxious. So, so you still have that feeling a little bit yeah. nowadays. Yeah. So okay. if I really want to overcome it, I'd have to do some kind of uh, flooding or, yeah. or, you know, Go, go after it again. All the other things I was afraid of, I defeated. They've they've, they've never never come back. But yeah. like I had horrible public speaking anxiety, and now I do it do it for a living. I, I keep after it. And, and the cool thing is, when you defeat a fear, as was the case in my own case, uh, the thing that you were afraid of becomes a great source of uh, joy. Generally, I, I loved going up on heights. When I overcame my fear of blood and worked in the Highland Emergency Room in, in Oakland, California. You with, became a vampire. Yes, I loved working <laughs> with trauma and massive people covered yeah. with blood and horrible, you know, beaten on the head with hammers and things and working with the trauma people, the, the surgeons, the, the ER doctor became a, a tremendous source of, of, of joy. And so that's something sim simple that, that that you can that you can do. There, there's many many forms of exposure that I've learned and, and, and developed. There's about five forms of interpersonal exposure for, for people, say with with, with shyness. Uh, so could you give some uh, random examples of what people could do? Um, yeah, like uh, one one tremendous thing is that. Let, let's say that you're you're shy and anxious around people. Right. Uh, one again m mistake that the shy people make is to both to avoid people. Yeah. And also to try to hide your anxiety, and fake it by by acting, you, you know, real. No. You trying, know. trying to look self-assured. Yeah, and you're not. Yeah, you know. exactly. And try to say something interesting yeah. when you're busy thinking about what a loser you are, yeah. and you come across in this forced, awkward way to the other person. And one of the most powerful techniques I've developed for treatment of shyness, although it's only one of twenty or thirty techniques I've learned or, or developed for shyness, is called self-disclosure, where you where you simply tell the person. Uh, that, that that you're feeling kind of shy and, and that you've always been ashamed of your shyness, so you've been hiding it, and so you're going to start to telling people and not not be ashamed anymore. It's called self disclosure, and it generally you get a great a great response from uh, fr from people when when you do that. When when I when we came out to to California uh, from Philadelphia, I taught at the local Kaiser here. 
and about cognitive uh, therapy. And then the, they didn't have a department chairman. And, and then they hired this, this de department chairman, had a reception for him. And they wanted me to, did I, have I talked about this? No, one? no, that doesn't ring a bell. And, and they wanted me to come to the reception, you know, to kind of welcome this, this fellow. And, and they gave me his, his CV where he lists all his papers and accomplishments. Yeah. And they wanted me to, to sit next to him at the reception and also, you know, speak to him about the teaching that, that, that I've been doing. Well, when I looked at his resume, I, I felt in, incredibly intimidated and anxious because he, he was from Harvard. He had all these prestigious awards. He, he was like kind of this upper-level, mm -hmm. high-powered person. And I see myself as kind of a low-level kind of per person okay and uh and and i was just saying oh do i have to go to this reception do i have to sit next to this guy do i have to go into his office and talk to him this sounded like a nightmare to me and so uh, what the solution i came up with when, when i went in to to talk to him i used self-disclosure and i can't even remember his name now but i said you know uh, ralph or dr peterson whatever his name was uh before we talk to you about the teaching I've been doing here with the staff, I just wanted to tell you that I've been looking at your resume and, and, and your accomplishments, and I've been feeling incredibly intimidated by all the amazing things that you've done. And gosh, I see you've done this and this and this, and, and I'm just feeling kind of blown away. So if I look real anxious when I'm talking to you, that that's why. Yeah. And that's called self-disclosure, but I also did it not in a self-effacing way, but in a flattering way to, 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 to him. And, oh, he thought that was the most wonderful thing in the world, and he got <laughs> so happy, and he said, oh, I'm so honored to be here, and I followed your work for years, and I'm a big fan of your book, Feeling Good, and I want to find out all about you know what we've been doing, and all of a sudden we were on a just a friendly, relaxed basis. And that, that's called self-disclosure. On Sunday's hike, we, we have a therapist, I won't mention her name, but who comes on the hikes because for a number of reasons, well, she did some really great grief work uh, about a week and a half ago, but, but she also has this severe uh, social anxiety. And, and so, so we had a new hiker, a, a, a lovely young woman from, from Iran who is very accomplished, speaks five languages, and she's a new Tuesday group member, really mm -hmm. neat, neat lady. And and uh, so the hiker told me, I'm feeling so intimidated and anxious right now because of this new hiker. So I said, well, just go back and tell her uh, that, that you feel real shy and, and, and awkward and you've always been ashamed of your shyness and you just wanted to, to, to let her know that. And she said, oh, I can't do that. That would be so weird. I says, no, you have to do that. Go and do it right now. Then I talked to the other woman. I said, here, this hiker needs to talk to you right now. So I kind of pushed her into it, yeah. pushed her to do the exposure. And Which so, is also a, a, a big part of, of the, the exercise, because if somehow you said, oh, you don't want to do it, well, that's okay. This would kind of reinforce that's that right. it is a that's terrible, right. difficult, yep. dangerous thing to do. Yeah, so the therapist has to have courage to push the patient and also a trusting relationship. So, yeah. so you have the leverage to do that, yeah. that pushing. So I pushed her and she went back and expressed this to the other woman and then they they hugged and they had this tremendous you know connection suddenly her her shyness and anxiety uh, disappeared and then that's the thing that works for her so she has to start doing that on an ongoing basis yeah. with colleagues even with with her patients uh, yeah. perhaps uh, but anyway that's today's podcast um, and it's it's something simple but it but it takes it takes courage in my own experience with myself and the tens of thousands of patients sessions I've had with anxious patients. It it's it, it's a fantastically powerful and, and mood elevating technique. If you read the book When Panic Attacks, it's not the only technique for for defeating anxiety. There's many other approaches as well. But but this is a, a time honored. A powerful and, and helpful way to uh, to defeat your fears and, and to get more joy and self-confidence and, and a sense of mastery uh, in your life. Yeah, and if our listeners would uh, you know go and try out some of those and, and uh, give us uh, their uh, feedback and reports in the show notes, that'd be great. Thank All you, right. Fabrice. Thanks, David. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, 
Visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.